Davy Rothbard is the creator of Found Magazine, which collects found objects, love letters, birthday cards, kids' homework, to-do lists, ticket stubs, poetry on napkins, receipts, doodles, anything that gives a glimpse into someone else's life. He's also a frequent contributor to Public Radio's This American Life and the author of the story collection, The Lone Surfer of Montana, Kansas. He writes regularly for GQ and Grantland, and his work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Believer. He's the founder of Washington to Washington, an annual hiking trip for inner city kids, and is also the co-director of the documentary film Medora to be released this November, which examines the struggles of small town America following a resilient high school basketball team in rural Indiana. His latest collection of essays is My Heart is an Idiot. Author Elizabeth Gilbert praised the book, saying, this book is fucking great. Nobody writes quite like Davy Rothbart because nobody lives quite like Davy Rothbart. A true and funny, ragged-hearted seeker of ecstasy, mystery, and human connection. This book contains some of the most perfect and heartbreaking writing that I have ever read. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Davy Rothbart. What's up? Uh, hi, guys. Hi. Yeah, all right, let's do it. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Davey. Brian, thanks for the beautiful introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I, you're in for a, a fun night because um, I, I have some fun stuff to share with you guys. And uh, I make this magazine called Found Magazine. It's all notes and letters that people have found on the ground, found on the street. Love letters, to-do lists, journal entries. People find this stuff, they send it to me from all over the country, really all around the world. And so what I want to do tonight is share with you guys some of my all-time favorites of the stuff that people have found and sent in, some new stuff that I've collected just in the last few weeks as I've been traveling around. I'm doing a 20-city tour in 27 days, and this is the second-to-last city, so I've gotten some great finds over the last month, and I'll share some brand new ones with you guys. And uh, I also, I wrote this book. It's called My Heart is an Idiot. And uh, there's, it's, it's pretty personal. And I'm going to share with you guys a very personal story later tonight. Um, one that I've, I'm kind of nervous tonight because I've only read this thing like two or three times in my life. Uh, but I thought it would be uh, a good night to read it to you guys because the story takes place largely in San Francisco. So I'll share that with you a little bit later. Let me just start out by giving you a sense of the kinds of stuff that people are finding and sending into us. It's stuff like this one. My friend in New York, uh, she lives in Brooklyn. And she found this piece of paper blowing down the street in front of her apartment. It's written to a guy named Delane. It says, Dear Delane, you and I are just friends. That's the way I wish to remain. I like you, but only as a friend. I would be happy if this doesn't affect our bond as friends. <laughs> Please understand, it's not because you're not handsome enough. It's just because you and I are friends, and that's it. The reason, you, the reason you can't be my boyfriend is because I'm not as attracted to you as you are to me. To be honest, I just want us to be friends, that's all. It's your choice whether you want to be my friend or not. Signed, Julia. P.S. Let's just be friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wonder if Delane, you know, the woman that found it, she said she, she wonders if Delane ever got the subtle hint that Julia just wanted to be friends. <laughs> So many of the finds that people send into us, these are literally just you know, pieces of paper that were blown down the street on the floor of the subway in New York or, or the BART train here. You know, people find this stuff, they send it to us. So many of them seem to deal with love and relationships. So I thought that would be a fun way to start out, sharing some all-time favorites. This one came from Portland, Oregon. And uh, it seems like it's a guy who's counseling his friend who's in the early, early stages of a relationship. He's just trying to give him some advice. So he says, don't rush things. Be her friend first. Take her out for lunch. Ask her, would you like to go out for lunch? My treat, please. Come on, please. So I like how he's, you know, anticipating rejection for his friend before he's even really had a chance. And then this one came from San Francisco. I, I, I had the, the honor of sharing this one earlier today. On, uh, on, there's a great radio show here in San Francisco called uh, Forum. It's on KQED. Yeah, you guys know that show? My friend Kaylin Cronin 
works there and was, was uh, generous enough to invite me on. Um, I shared this one because I, I love the San Francisco find. This woman, she got to work in the morning and she found in the office fax machine these three mysterious faxes that had come through in the middle of the night. And there was you know, no idea who, the, who had sent them in. They're just you know, handwritten faxes. But they have the time code up top so you can see when they came in. And the first one's from 2.36 a.m. It says, I just want Gigi back. Tell me where she is and I'll come get her. Why are you doing this? Be a man. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Next one, a few minutes later. This is cruel and emotional abuse. And one of you drive the women you're with crazy. They either join cults or want to kill themselves. Be a man for once in your life. The world doesn't revolve around you. Just let me have Gigi now. I can't believe you're even doing this. I will come get her. If not, I'm calling the police. All right. And finally, the last fax at 2.56 a.m., it just says, sorry, wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, I don't know if you can see up front, there's a kind of like an oops, my bad face. <laughs> John there. <laughs> if you look up oops, my bad on Wikipedia, you see that face. Um, I don't know if any of you guys work at a school or, uh, or, uh, or attend middle school. Some of you guys? Yeah. Um, but if you do, if you live near a school, you know, you know that kids are great at losing stuff. And the stuff they lose is, is incredible. So this was found by my friend. He's a middle school teacher in Houston, Texas. And he found this in the playground one day after class. And it says, that it's like in a middle schooler's handwriting. It says at the top, Erica Rioja. Erica Rioja. Erica, we the boys want to know. Why are you going out with Nathan? <laughs> and you like all of us in a way. Tell us why and list how much you like the person with their name. For example, Fred, not at all. <laughs> Sorry for asking you all these questions, but we the boys want to know and get to the bottom of this. <laughs> I'm always having to write these letters because they, they are some punks. The rest of the boys, you don't have to tell us right away, but do tell us. Me, Fred, and Ricky thought of writing to you, but really it was just Fred. All the boys in the sixth grade likes you, except for some. That means you are the finest girl in the whole sixth grade. <laughs> a few of them like you because of you know what. <laughs> but I don't. I like you because you have a pretty face, a pretty smile. And you're the only girl that has a little piece of hair going down her face. I think that makes you even prettier. You said that was your own style, and I think that's so cool, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's all for now, so I'll see you on the flip side. Peace out. P.S. Call me if you want to talk about something or tell me about myself. <laughs> you know my number, and if you don't, then I'll tell you in your ear, because I don't want any other girl but you to know my number, not even Aisha. <laughs> all right, here. This is, I, I have so many favorite finds from San Francisco. I, I usually don't even read all these, but I was looking through my stack of favorite finds, and I pulled out a bunch to share with you guys tonight. This one um, is it's a, written to a guy named Lionel, and it's, uh, it's from a girl named Tara. Here it is. Dear Lionel, I just wanted to let you know, because when I saw you last, I didn't really see any need to explain myself to you. However, I find this one issue nagging at me. First off, I don't think you're needy. I was just teasing you. But I get why it's stuck in your head and it was offensive, because you're thinking I'm not a person who could defend myself or stick up for myself. But that's so ridiculous. If this is really what you think, you need to take two steps back and look again, because you have no fucking idea. <laughs> look, sweetheart, I was buying guns for a rebel army in the jungles of Central America when I was 18 years old. Nobody fucks with me that doesn't get fucked back. However, I'm also a very friendly, kind, compassionate, loving person. <laughs> and I've learned to choose my battles wisely. That's what's made me a woman. <laughs> you got your own ideas about what was going on at the club, but just so you know, I may not be the girl you're thinking I am. I'm going to tell you this because I like you. Catch you later, Tara. Huh. That's, That's You wrote that. Tara's here tonight. You found it. What's your, that's amazing. What's your name? And you gave it to me at, at Clean Well Lighted Place for Books. Seven years ago. I remember fucking everything, man. <laughs> and it's your 40th birthday coming up? Yeah. Happy birthday, brother. That's amazing.
Uh, that's why I travel around the country to collect found stuff. So many people, they're like, dude, I was saving some found stuff for you for like three years. It was on my cabinet. And uh, I never mailed it in, but I saw you were playing at the bar near my house, so I, here it is. You know, it's like you have to physically go to every city in the country to collect this stuff sometimes. I remember, I remember getting that fine from you. Um, this, uh, you know, I talked about finding stuff near schools, and uh, this came from a, from a middle school. Uh, let me see. It was actually, yeah, I think it was a middle school in South Bend, Indiana. It's this kid's report for class. This kid named Justin Hensel wrote this report called What I Know About U.S. History. So here's the front of it, here's the back, and there's this drawing of Mickey Mouse on there that doesn't relate to anything else on the paper, but I just kind of love his little drawing. So it, Justin Hensel, this is his report that he, you know, he went all out on. Here it, is, here it is. Justin Hensel, What I Know About U.S. History by Justin Hensel. Betsy Ross saw the first American flag. George Washington was the first American president. George Washington was a general in the war. Martin Luther King was a civil rights leader. Chris Columbus discovered America. George Washington cut down his father's cherry tree with an ax that his father gave to him for his birthday. The Black Panther was started during the Vietnam War. The Sputnik satellite was launched. Man went to outer space. Malcolm X began his quest for freedom. The Constitution was signed. The Boston Tea Party happened. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-government group, the Anarchy, was started. <laughs> King Tut's tomb was discovered. The stoplight was invented. The 1967 Ford Mustang Shelby was introduced. Nitrous oxide was allowed to be used in muscle cars, show cars, and modified racing cars for use in drag racing in 1978. <laughs> Fine moment in U.S. history. <laughs> Black people won the right for freedom. Hitler began the Nazi Klan. Ted Bundy was sentenced, then committed suicide. Richard Chase was murdered. JFK was assassinated. Richie Valens died in a plane crash. Edgar Allan Poe's short stories and poems were published. Elvis died of an OD. Jimi Hendrix died. Jim Morrison died. Paul McCartney... <laughs> was knighted, <laughs> another fine, fine moment in U.S. history, right? <laughs> and finally, Justin Hensel was born. <laughs> All right, um, college campuses, great place to find stuff. I, I shared this one with my man, uh, Mike, Mikey Krasny, earlier tonight. Spilling. That's all right. Um, this is, uh, you know, no, I always find great stuff on college campuses. I'm from, a, I'm from a college town, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Anybody from Ann Arbor area? I met a couple <laughs> earlier, earlier, earlier tonight. I met a couple of Ann Arbor people. Yeah. Um, this one was found uh, in Austin, Texas, outside of a dormitory on the University of Texas. It says, Jenna, can I give you a sensual massage? Then I will talk about Jesus. <laughs> I'm always like, shit, my shoulders are sore. I could use some spiritual guidance. You know, where's this guy when you need him? I found this one myself 10 years ago when we, when we first started Found Magazine in Chicago. Um, I found this by the DePaul campus. And it's kind of an ordinary flyer, um, but there's you know, a guy looking for a roommate. But there was two weird things about it. First of all, there was 200 of these flyers posted all over campus, each one individually handwritten. Dude, Kinko's, man. <laughs> Check it out. So it starts out pretty normal. He's like, hey, I'm looking for a roommate in Lincoln Park, male or female, reasonable rent, lots of room, cool, responsible, laid back guy. For more info, call 847-647-7700. Ask for Dan. Here's where it gets a little weird. He says, please call after 1045 or 11 p.m. to 1245 a.m. or 630 to 9 or 920 to 1130 a.m. Call ASAP. What is this guy doing from 9 to 920 every morning? He can't answer the damn phone. I don't know, man. Having a sensual massage, talking about Jesus. Uh, sometimes we get, uh, you know, well, I, I went to the University of Michigan, and uh, I would find, yeah, go blue. I would find in the campus computer center, people would print out all these papers for class and never collect them, you know, or their emails and stuff like that. I'd always sift through those before, you know, before I started found, but I just thought this stuff was interesting. And so somebody sent me this. This was found in a uh, campus computer center at, at Middle Tennessee State University, which is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, as you know. And uh, this is, um, <laughs> this is a, re a report for class called More Respect. It was in the first issue of Found Magazine, Found Number One. It says, More Respect. Oh, and uh, I got to say, there's a few things in here that are in all caps, so I'll give added volume to those so you, so you know. All right, More Respect by Joe. 
Respect is needed toward Marilyn Manson, Corn, and Tool, which are all underground bands 10 years ago. All right. Which means they want to make it to the top without being supported by the TV or radio, but they're not the only ones doing this. Then there's Marilyn Manson, man of his word in my eyes, because I respect him a lot. Because Marilyn Manson stands for your good side and your bad side, like Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson. <laughs> and that's all he's trying to represent, along with him being the Antichrist superstar. Which means you're against God and the devil, but you worship yourself. Mr. Marilyn Manson is very racist because his music for, is intended for whites only, and I'm glad it's for white people only because it's about time there's something for one race only. <laughs> Marilyn Manson made over $2 million alone just by going on the 1996 Dead to the World Tour. Corn and Tool are among a lot of other underground bands like the Deftones and Pantera. But the fans are great to us, says John Davis, leader of the five-man band Corn. Then there's Tool, a band that tours a lot with Corn. But both bands feel they're getting the respect they need. But in my eyes, there's no respect for them where I live, but I hope that will soon change. To make it clear, Found Magazine does not endorse the opinions of the authors of these Found Notes, but it is an interesting glimpse in, into someone else's perspective. From UC Davis. Uh, this, this pop quiz, uh, you know, this kid must have taken this pop quiz in class, and these are his five answers to this quiz, all right? So you can, you can deduce what some of the questions might have been, and some of them I have no idea. Here's his five answers to this quiz. He says, number one, I would name my twins Mickey and Minnie. Cool. <laughs> number two, hell no, hell no! <laughs> if you're gonna control the U.S. Armed Forces, you have to be born and raised right here in the U.S. of A. Number three, the book would be about the ghettos of the world, and the title would be the ghettos of the world. <laughs> Available at dog ear, dog ear books. Number four, set my arms on fire using rubbing alcohol or spitting flames using rubbing alcohol. What question elicited that response? <laughs> Still trying to figure that one out. Number five, I love you, God. Jesus, save me. Must have gotten a central massage. <laughs> I don't know. All right. A couple last college finds. This one from a city that will remain nameless. I try to protect the guilty in some of these. And what was found, it was out on this camp, college campus. You know, at the end of the semester, you take those uh, teacher course evaluations. And I used to be charitable to my teachers. It's a tough job. I give them the benefit of the doubt. But somebody found a whole packet of the, 20 of these things at this un, uh, you know, anonymous college campus. And uh, so 17, this class must have been crazy. 17 of the kids talked about how the teacher would bring her six cats to class every day. <laughs> Just fucked up. <laughs> Three of the kids, there's only three that didn't mention the cats. This guy's got something else to say. He says, I cannot remember anything about the content of a specific class any more than I can recall the most boring moments of my life. The educational value was so phenomenally low that my frustration grew into hatred for the teacher. And then it became more widespread, affecting my family and friends and possibly people I never even met before <laughs> until finally I reached the point where I hated myself for being there. <laughs> I hate to name names, but this is what a Duke University education will, will get you. It was actually found in Durham, North Carolina. Fuck the Blue Devils. Go Blue. Seriously. One last college find from Austin, Texas. Uh, a lot, we get a lot of great stuff from Austin. This one says, um, Dear Alicia, what were you thinking? Fucking Ben in the next room while I was sick with mono? You are a dirty bitch and I rebuke you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had something special. Clearly you didn't. Hope you enjoy tramping it up in fucking half of Austin. Please die. Sincerely, Roger. <laughs> and let's be honest, all right, who among us has not received a note like this at some point in the last 48 hours, you know? Isaac Fitzgerald received three of those. All right. <laughs> this one, oh, okay, I have some San Francisco fines I put aside. Um, this one, you know, some of these fines are, you know, people are mad, angry, upset, using all kind of uh, cuss words. And then some are unexpectedly polite. And this one came from San Fran, um, found by uh, Anna Clafter. It says, uh, it, well, it was posted to a poll. It says, courtesy notice. There will be a funeral Wednesday held at the Hells Angels Clubhouse. We would greatly appreciate your parking space for out-of-town guests. Thank you so much, Frisco Hells Angels. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it up, rebels. <laughs>
Um, this is a really fucked up one. It's not that funny, but it's interesting. Um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, thank God you guys are political minded, you know, and there's all kinds of great marches here and it inspires the rest of the country, seriously. Um, but, uh, you know, we had these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and apparently you guys did a peace march. And uh, my friend attended it, and he, and he said it was really peaceful. And then a, a week later, he, uh, my friend Seth, he lives over in, uh, in Oakland. Uh, he's a public defender here in San Francisco. But he, but he found this thing a week later downtown in San Francisco. It was a police report. It was like a, police's, uh, a police officer's uh, this kind of written statement uh, based on something that happened at this peace march, which he said was, Seth said was completely peaceful. And so it says, uh, this, police, this policeman writes, he says, while working a crowd control assignment on March 20th, our platoon was assigned to stop a riotous crowd, which was eastbound on Mission Street. Our platoon formed a skirmish line across Mission Street and proceeded westbound. When the violent mob of rioters came into contact with our line, I verbally told several of the conspirators to reverse direction or they would be struck. Most of the mob began to move westbound on Mission Street, but some insisted on testing my resolve. One white male, 22 years old, black jacket, pants, and bandana over his face, attempted to grab my baton. I skillfully parried his move and struck him twice in zone one of his body. The coward then ran away into the crowd. <laughs> what is zone one of your body? I, I don't know, but I don't want to be struck there with a baton. So, saying, thank you guys for doing peaceful marches, and I hate when they, when they break that shit up. You know, I saw that movie Milk, and I thought it was amazing, but it's always like 30 years later when people realize, you know, the marchers are the ones to be lionized, <laughs> and, and uh, the people shutting it down are the, are the villains. Uh, another San Francisco find, and I moved to LA a couple years ago, so I, I relate to this one because some of you guys might live in apartments like me that have a shared laundry facility, and so, uh, you know, there's always, like, someone will post a flyer about something or an, an angry note, and someone else will respond to it. It's kind of like an online discussion board, but hanging, you know, happening all on one piece of paper. So this was found here in San Francisco. It says, Dear Blue-Haired Gentlemen, I decided to voice my support for you in the current dryer wars. <laughs> Everyone knows that only one dryer works and you should not have to wait for someone to remove their items in order to dry your own. This is not why I'm writing this though. The marvelous editing you provided the first writer was excellent. My question comes down to this. If I leave letters and other items here, can they be proofread and corrected as well? <laughs> Yours truly get over it, they're only clothes. <laughs> All right, one more San Francisco find. This, this guy is one of my favorite finders of all time. Daniel Klaus. Uh, he lives, one, a great, great comic writer. You guys have seen 8-Ball Comics. He wrote Ghost World, which they turned into that great movie. So Dan Klaus lives over in the East Bay, and he, and he finds this stuff when he's walking his dog every day. So he's sent us, he's, he has sent us great stuff over the years. So um, he sent us these two flyers. I, I, I blew them up at Kinko's, because I know about Kinko's. <laughs> um, and I'm available from 9 to 9.20. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to wait. But... The, but uh, but this, this guy, uh, well, Dan found these two flyers, and they seem related. He found them like a month apart. So the first one's pretty ordinary. It's just a guy, um, let's see, here, it, here it is. It says, uh, internet help, help in setting up for Mac or Windows, finding a service provider, setting up your account, creating worldwide web pages, maintaining a website. Call Ross, 510-883-1027. right, so here's Ross. If you need a website, call him up. That actually is his real number. Uh, I called it, and he's a cool guy. Usually we change the names and numbers in the magazine. He was like, yeah, just, you just run it as normal. Maybe I'll get some business out of it. All right, so that's Ross. A month later, Dan Klaus walking his dog in the East Bay, and he, he finds this one. It says, when you have questions, I deliver answers, clairvoyant readings with Reverend Ross Ureri. <laughs> Same dude. <laughs> and you start reading this thing. You don't know if it's like a personal ad or an ad for a business. He's like, uh, currently I'm involved with the production of a series of videos dealing in the correct use of psychic power. I've been a staff member of the Academy of Psychic Studies for over six years. I served in our country's armed forces for 14 years. Naturally, I would never hire a clairvoyant that doesn't have some armed forces experience. <laughs> if you haven't been in the shit, you ain't talking to my dead grandma. Fuck that. Let's move along. Let's move along. Um, I'm a list maker. I always make to-do lists, so I, I love when people find to-do lists and send it in to me. This was a one-item to-do list found in Las Vegas on the elevator of the Palms Casino Resort. It just says, must win money. 
<laughs> and then from St. Louis came this one. It says, to do today, turn on library books, find out about college, mail dad's shit, pay bills in advance, write crystal, hide guns. <laughs> from Atlanta, uh, goals for today, number one, go to church, find God, then find myself through God, get baptized. Number two, meet new people, party a lot, start drinking. <laughs> Busy ass day. <laughs> um, from Traverse City, Michigan, which, uh, as you may know, it's way up north, way up north, northern Michigan. It says, to today, create a circuit of pirate radio stations in, in the Traverse City area. Open an arcade, open a coffee shop called The Joint. See all my favorite musicians in concert. Wipe out my entire Amazon.com wish list. Straighten out my left arm, make my legs an even length. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, from Berlin to Vermont came the first ever to not do list. Somebody found this on the street in Burlington. It says the to not do list. Do not spend money on anything except clothing for Halloween, grocery items, Sarah's birthday dinner, sushi, metal show, and the movie Kill Bill. Save all other money. Do not fall in love with any strangers. Do not procrastinate the trip to Japan. Do not eat junk, any form of potato or corn chips. No Fritas, no Lay's, no Ruffles, no Cape Cod, nothing. Do not start another tab at work. Do not fret over Wendy or in any case being alone. Do not borrow money from mom. Do not eat at Oasis or any shit food place. Do not watch pornographic movies. Do not masturbate. Do not masturbate. <laughs> I don't know how my list got mixed up and all the rest of this shit, but <laughs> shit. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It was found on the streets of Burlington, Vermont, where I lost it. <laughs> this one from Hartford, Connecticut. It's in like a kid's handwriting. It says things to do. And the first three are crossed out. They must have been done. Things to do, get new skateboard deck, crossed out. Think of band names, crossed out. Get lawn mowing service going, crossed out. The last two still yet to be done. Hook up with Jen, make it to the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> I, have, I have some all-time favorite finds to share with you guys at the end and a couple more brand new ones. But uh, let me, I, I, I want to share with you guys a piece from this book, My Heart is, My Heart is an Idiot. And it's a piece that I've, I've only read a couple times before, so I I'm, I'm actually am nervous to, to share with you guys, but um, it'll, be, it'll be really fun to, to read it to you guys for one of the first times ever. Um, let me do two things first. Let me pass around these guys. Um, actually, let me, let me do this flyers. Is there anybody here? Yeah, I told you, it's the second to last night of a 20-city tour. Is there anybody here who has a friend that lives in Los Angeles, California? That's, so, okay, some of you guys, um, listen, I'm going to pass around these flyers, and it's got all the details of our L.A. show, which is two weeks from now. The tour is kind of weird. It's all broken up. Uh, I'm going to pass around these flyers. Please, if you have friends in L.A., let them know we're headed their way. It's going to be a really special night to wrap up the whole rest of the tour. So can you pass, pass this around? And then the other thing I want to do is I want to ask you guys to write your name and email on this found email list. I like to email you once a month, let you know what's going on in the found magazine world, some of the special projects that we're working on that we really want your help with, and also when we're having an event again in, in this area. So even if you already get emails from me and from found magazine, uh, please put your name and email on here so I'll know you're here tonight. Can you guys pass these around to you? All right, let's, let's dig into this thing. So this, this essay I want to read to you guys. Well, I, I, let me, how do I explain this thing? Um, I, I, I was lucky enough when I first started touring the country. You know, I work for this radio show called This American Life. You guys get that? Is it, did they play that on KQED? They do? They do? What, time, what time is it on here in San Francisco? Just once a week, Saturday at noon? All right, cool. They play it again some, another time? In the evening? All right. Um, you know, when I first started touring around, I was traveling with, you know, my heroes, Ira Glass, Sarah Vowell, David Sedaris, you know. We did a lot of great tours around the country and had so much fun. And I learned so much from these guys. And, and Sarah Vowell, you know, she used to tell me, you know, I was, I was like, you know, how do I know what essays to read? She said, always go for the yucks. You know, read your funniest shit 
and you know, people will love it. You'll know that people are listening if they're laughing and responding. And then uh, David Sedaris gave me great advice. He said, you know, stand in front of a mirror and just read your pieces a hundred times so that you can like look up at the crowd. You know, you, you've mem- basically memorized it. And at that point, you're just kind of like reading it, but you're looking up at the crowd. You can make eye contact and just be, you know, be more present with them. And um, so I've taken that advice. And, you know, over the years, I, I usually read stuff that's funny, um, stuff, you know, that, that I know really well that I've read many times before. So tonight I'm going to flush that advice down the toilet um, and, and just share with you guys a piece I've almost never read. I've read it like two or three times in my life before, but, it, but it's one, because I'm here in San Francisco, I thought I would share a piece from the book that takes place here. Um, about half of it takes place here. So, um, And w- what's the story about? It's, well, it happened about, it's called Canada or Bust. And, and in the book, let me, let me explain the book. It's, my heart is an idiot. It's uh, stories about my own misadventures in the arena of love and relationships. And it's also about in- interesting people I've met over the last 10 years, traveling around the country, doing Found Magazine. You know, I've, met, I've met some really great, great people. And so a lot of these great, a lot of these stories, I can't say they're great. They're, they're okay. But a lot, of these, a lot of these stories are about great people that I've met traveling around the country. And this one, uh, the, oh, the other thing is it's a bit longer. You know, you normally I read like a five-minute, six-minute piece. That was Sarah Val's advice, you know, go brief. This piece takes me 15 minutes to read it. You guys, can you hang? Yeah? Fuck it. What? Yeah, let's do it. All right. It's Thursday night. All right. Um, then there's, you know, hopefully there's a couple humorous moments in this, in this piece. I don't think it's totally like, you know, like no humor or something, but, um, but just, it's just different. It's different than what I would normally read in the event, but let's, let's, let's get in there. All right, so this piece, it's called Canada or Bust. It's, it happened, um, let me think, what year was it? It was uh, about five years ago. Here we go. And then I'm going to wrap up at the end with a few of my all-time favorite finds. And also, actually, after I read this piece, we're going to do a little Q&A section of the show, which I love doing. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll, I'll, it's an AMA. I'll, I'll, I'll answer anything. Here we go. Canada or Bust. My friend Tim Nordwind is the bass player for the band OK Go, and he'd been invited one Sunday night to DJ at a bar on Sunset Boulevard called Hyde Lounge. Since he knew I was visiting L.A., he asked me to come down and hang. I'm usually a dive bar sort of guy, but I'd heard that Hyde Lounge was L.A.'s fanciest, most exclusive club, and I was pretty sure that getting my name on the list at Hyde Lounge would impress Missy Freeze, the beautiful blonde-haired girl I'd met earlier in the week. Missy had grown up in rough and tumble Youngstown, Ohio, but now lived in Beverly Hills and worked in special promotions for St. Pauli Girl, the beer, which meant that she dressed up as, as the St. Pauli Girl at conventions, movie premieres, outdoor rock concerts, and other events and served beer to people. I'm always drawn to girls like this. <laughs> I dream of burrowing through their lacquered shell of professional friendliness to investigate the soulful edges I glimpse underneath. OMG, Missy texted back instantly. How'd you get on the list at Hyde? Her excitement was promising. And at dinner, she amazed me with stories of her childhood in Youngstown, among hardened pool hall types with names like Wrench, Smoke, and Burn. But once we were through the doors at Hyde, she saw a guy she recognized, handsome and Natalie dressed, and whisked off with him upstairs without a look back. I kicked it briefly with Tim in the DJ booth, but he was busy spinning records. So I left him alone and skulked around the bar for a half hour, sipping a $20 drink, half looking for Missy and soaking up the atmosphere. Young Hollywood agents in silver suits mixing it up with waifish models in slinky dresses. At 33, I was probably the oldest person in the room, and I felt myself attracting odd looks like an old craggy barfly who's sure to cause a fight. In a dark corner, looking equally lonesome, was Pau Gasol, the Spanish basketball star who'd just been traded to the Lakers. I asked if I could join him, and for 20 minutes, we chatted amiably about Barcelona and absently watched as his new teammate, Sasha Vujicic, swayed on the dance floor with a girl in high heels he'd apparently just met, relentlessly sucking face. I explained to Pau the term sucking face and told him I'd always hated it because it seemed vulgar when kissing could be so tender and exquisite. But he argued that in this instance, it was fiercely apt. (laughs) He repeated it a few times, tickled by the expression, sucking face. Wait, is it sucking the face? No, it's just sucking face. <laughs> Finally, Vujicic broke off and headed for the John, and I caught sight of Missy on the dance floor with the guy she'd bumped into, 
laughing and smiling, tugging at his tie. That's her, I cried to Pow, pointing. Who, the girl you were telling me about? Oh, shit, that's not good. The guy had pulled her close, and as we looked on, they began to furiously make out. Pow shook his head solemnly. Sorry, man, he said, downing the rest of his drink. Damn, sucking the face. <laughs> Missy, I figured, could find her own way home. After a couple of shots with Pow, I barged out of Hyde Lounge, and on the sidewalk out front, I ran into two black teenagers selling bootlegged hip-hop CDs. We talked for a couple of minutes, and they introduced themselves as Tito and Score. Tito was the wilder of the pair, light-skinned with long dreadlocks. He asked, if I played an in, he asked if I played an instrument. That was one of the things Sedaris always told me. He's like, if you know these things, if you've read it 100 times in front of a mirror, you will never stumble, you'll never fuck up. But uh, like I said, I've only read this two or three times, so I will stumble plenty. <laughs> um, he asked if I, was pl if I played an instrument, and, I re and he revealed that he was starting a metal band, that we still needed a drummer, bassist, and guitarist. He would, <laughs> he would supply all the vocals. <laughs> Score, dark and gangly, shook, stood shyly behind him, nodding along. They said they'd been drifting around the country and now were headed north toward Canada. Their next stop, they hoped, was the Bay Area. As it happened, I decided in the previous few minutes, as I watched Missy swirling tongues with the guy who had not got her dinner or not bought her, got her into High Lounge, that L.A. had grown old and it was time for me to head to San Francisco to check in with some friends up there. I gave Tito and Score my phone number. Call me tomorrow, I said. You guys can ride with me. My phone started ringing at 8 in the morning. But it was neither Tito nor Score. It was Missy. I let it go to voicemail, then instantly listened to the voicemail she had left. I'm so sorry about last night, she said, sounding legitimately distressed. I can't believe what I did to you. I used to date that guy, Martin. And I was drinking, and I just got all... Anyway, that was really fucked up with me, and I'm sorry, and I hope I can make it up to you later this week. With that, my planned trip to San Francisco was canceled. <laughs> I went back to sleep for several hours and had forgotten all about Tito and Score and my ride offer when my phone rang again in the mid-afternoon from an unfamiliar L.A. number. It was Score calling from a payphone. His real name, he said, was Hakeem. He, started, he still wanted to get up to the Bay Area, but there was a problem. He couldn't find Tito. They'd arranged to meet at Hollywood and Vine, he told me, but it was three hours later. Tito still hadn't shown. I explained that my trip was on hold, and he said, oh, with such disappointment and skepticism that I sat up straight. I could sense his train of thought. Yeah, like some random white dude was really going to give a seven-hour ride to a couple of hood rats he met on the street. His lost faith in me felt like a challenge, a challenge worth rising to. Besides, what the hell was I doing hanging around L.A. waiting on the St. Pauli girl when I'd likely have a better chance with any girl in any bar in San Francisco? Tell you what, I said, fuck it. I'll give you a ride to the bay. Fine, Tito. But score, Hakeem, stunned me. He explained that he'd just met Tito the night before. How weird. The night before, I'd thought of them as this inseparable team. Tito and Score, Score and Tito, the dynamic duo. Somehow in my drunken state, I believed they'd been friends for years. I'd imagine themselves playing, their, uh, I'd imagine them playing themselves as the swashbuckling, the swashbuckling protagonists of a road film called Tito and Score, which I hope to one day write and direct. <laughs> now, Tito is nowhere to be found. No matter, I told Hakeem I'd pick him up at 10 o'clock that night. Where do you want to meet? I asked. How about the parking lot of the Verizon store? I think it's like sunset and I don't know. He had a shroomer's spacey affect. Hold on, he said. I heard him calling out to a passerby. Hey, what street is this? Western? Okay, thanks. He giggled into the phone. Okay, sunset and Western. Cool, I'll see you there. I hung up and began crafting a text to Missy, working hard to seem chipper and careful to allude to vague creative projects in the works with collaborators in the bay so that it would appear that I was bolting north not as a spurned suitor, but as an impulsive globetrotter whose artist lifestyle sometimes demanded last-minute travel. <laughs> she texted me right back, I'll come with you, St. Pauli event in Palo Alto Tuesday. <laughs> oh, shit, hold on a second, hold on a second. Sorry, sorry, intermission. A few hours later, I caught sight of Hakeem in the parking lot before he saw me and Missy. While we were still at the light at Western, a quarter block away, he wore a camo backpack and had a small blue duffel bag hanging off one shoulder. In his arms, he cradled what appeared to be a lone raggedy turntable, its cord dangling behind him like an untied shoelace. 
We were half an hour late, and he was searching the passing traffic with the hopeful but anxious and half-defeated look of someone who, who fears he's been stood up. The light changed, and when I roared up beside him in my borrowed Jeep, he lit up with a gigantic, relieved smile. I jumped out and gave him a little handshake and half hug, and we placed his duffel bag and turntable in the back seat. He hopped in on the other side, and the three of us got on the 101, headed north. Hakeem, smiley, somehow both shy and talkative, perhaps a bit blazed, told us his story. He was 19 and had grown up in a rough part of Las Vegas. He'd finished high school the previous June and soon realized there wasn't much for him to do in Vegas besides get into trouble. He'd always loved DJ culture and underground hip hop, and a dream had formed inside him like a hot molten rock. He wanted to get a pair of Techniques turntables and go to Canada and become a DJ. Why Canada? He'd once had a conversation with someone who'd been to Vancouver, and it sounded like a paradise. Lush, racially tolerant, and highly cultured. He also appreciated its lax marijuana laws and what he perceived to be its general laid-back vibe. Also, he imagined that there were fewer DJs in Canada than L.A., and it'd be easier to break in as a young DJ. Along the way, he had some stops to make. He wanted to visit a library in Oakland that he'd been told his grandfather had helped to open. He wanted to try to find some other relatives in the Bay Area who he hadn't seen in a decade. And he wanted eventually, maybe after a spell in Canada, to find his dad, who he'd never met his whole life but who he knew lived in Newark, New Jersey, at an address he kept on a deeply worn and creased pink post-it note, which he pulled from his back pocket to show to me and Missy. They call him Score, too, he said. That's kind of how I got the name. Hakeem had left home nine months before and started his journey in L.A., where he'd been ever since, living on the streets for weeks, even months at a time, and then getting a room and a house for a month or two when he could afford it. He'd been hustling CDs on the street and working as a canvasser for environmental groups. He was internet savvy enough to negotiate Craigslist for jobs and temporary sublets, but still had spent most nights sleeping in parks and on the beach or in, a, in abandoned buildings occupied by squatters and crackheads. He seemed to simultaneously be a homeless street kid and also be an undercover reporter observing the lives of homeless street kids. He was full of keen observations and funny, affecting stories about other kids he'd met, like Tito. After about 90 minutes of rapid-fire talk, We'd wound our way up the mountains on I-5, just north of the city, and we're headed down the long decline on the other side into the central California plains. Hakeem produced an old Gangstar CD from his backpack and asked me to put it on, and 30 seconds later, he was in a deep sleep. I kept driving. Missy smiled over at me, the blue iridescent lights of the dashboard dials casting her in a soft glow. With her large eyes, button nose, and shining teeth, and her childlike kindness and innocence, she reminded me of Ariel from The Little Mermaid. <laughs> There's no feeling like gliding down the interstate to the desolate flatlands with a beautiful girl in the passenger seat, especially one you hardly know. The world was ripe and swirling with mystery and possibility. Missy outlined her schedule for the week. She was working at a tech convention at Stanford on Tuesday evening and a UFC match on Thursday at an arena in San Jose. Her St. Pauli girl costume was packed in a small vintage suitcase way in the back. The folks she worked for had reserved hotel rooms for her from Tuesday night on, she told me. But it wasn't clear from the way she said it if she was inviting me to spend the whole week with her or not. I was pretty sure that the work on my project in San Francisco could be shuffled to the following week since it had been made up in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> when we got to the bay, I suggested Missy could crash with me at my friend's apartment and I'd roll her down to Palo Alto the next day. Soon her lids grew heavy and before long she was sleeping too. I cranked the music up and opened my windows to let in some night air, dank with cow dung and fertilizer, but blissful nonetheless. We pushed north past Bakersfield. I kept peeking over to watch my passengers sleep. It felt like Missy was my wife and Hakeem was our kid, though I'd only known them for five days combined. <laughs> Still, on a drive like that, you get a sense for how joyous it might be to have a family of your own. Around 3 a.m. at a gas station outside Fresno, I stopped to refill the tank and grab some snacks. Hakeem roused awake long enough to request a bottle of water and a granola bar. But by the time I came back out, he was already asleep again. It was as if he hadn't closed his eyes in six months. After another hour, the highway widened and orange streetlights sprouted along the shoulder and the median, signaling that we were close to Oakland. At the toll booth for the Bay Bridge, a woman in her 50s blasted soul music on a tiny radio and wailed along almost oblivious to us as she took a 10-spot from me and passed back to change. Hakeem sat up and rubbed his eyes. 
We rose up onto the bridge. The whole bay spread out before us. The buildings of downtown San Francisco clustered slumbering in the dark. Day or night, this vista has always been one of my favorite views of any city anywhere. I turned and said, welcome to San Francisco, Hakeem. He nodded with a look in his eyes that I couldn't quite identify but took for quiet joy at being one step closer to his destination, Canada. But what would happen once he reached Canada? Missy and I had talked about it for a bit after he'd first fallen asleep. It's appealing to imagine that if we could just get that one thing in our life to work out, if we can get the job we want, finish writing that book, making that movie, get the right girl, or get to Canada, that everything will be solved, absolved, good to go for good. I stepped into that way of thinking way too often, I admitted to Missy, even though I knew that sometimes in life, all of a sudden, there you were, standing with your techniques turntables just across the Canadian border, and you're not a new you. You're just you, but in Canada. <laughs> it seemed from the way Hakeem dreamily talked of it that Canada to him was not so much a place but a sensation. He was seeking a sense of being home. He'd alluded to his mom's drug problems, told us that he'd come home from school some days to find that she'd hocked his CDs and Sega games at the pawn shops. Before leaving home, he told us, he'd essentially been responsible for taking care of his 14-year-old sister. The turntable he'd found on the street and set gingerly in the back of the Jeep was to be a birthday gift to her. She aspired to be a DJ like her older brother. Living on the LA streets while full of adventure and interesting characters was exhausting. The Canada of his imagination was a place where he could find community, maybe an established DJ to take him under his wing, and above all, a tranquil home. Maybe in Canada he'd find what he was looking for, I thought. Surely he would. He was friendly, if a little shy, bright, creative, not caught up in drinking or hard drugs. But it was a bit of a crapshoot. Starting fresh in a new place is never easy. I'd helped Hakeem get a few hundred miles closer to his destination, but I couldn't even provide him with a home for the night. I'd scored a couch for me and Missy from some girls I barely knew, and I, I didn't think I could show up at their place at 5 a.m. with a drifter I'd met the night before. More pertinently, I didn't want to jeopardize the possibility of sucking face with Missy once we landed. In the Castro, there's a dingy but always hopping 24-hour diner called Sparky's. Ten years before, I'd spent some lost, lonely nights there, sipping OJ, reading novels in a corner booth till dawn. I remembered flirting mildly with the guys in neighboring booths, not because I wanted to hook up, but because I just wanted to feel wanted by anybody. It was a lame place to abandon a new friend, but I couldn't think of anywhere else to drop Hakeem off. He grabbed his backpack and his little blue duffel from the back of the truck, and I offered to hold onto the turntable for a while so he wouldn't have to lug it around with him. I gave him a found magazine t-shirt, a couple magazines, and a bottle of water and granola bar I'd bought for him at that roadside 76 station. I felt a sad wave crash over me like a parent dropping their kid off at college. Hakeem assured me he'd be fine. Get out of here, he said. Go on, it's late. Tell Missy it was fun talking to her. She was dozing in the passenger seat. All right, call me tomorrow, I said. He smiled, I will. We hugged, and I waited till he went inside and found a seat at my old corner booth as it happened. Then I hopped back in the truck and drove off through the silence and the stillness of the city. In my friend's apartment in the mission, me and Missy lurched quietly upstairs and headed for the couch they'd made up for us. We sat a couple of feet apart. After a long drive through the night, when you finally sit down, the world always feels like it's still in motion. I took Missy's hand in mine, my heart pounding once, heavily, like the drunken wallop of a bass drum. She pulled her hand back a bit and whispered, I think we should sleep head to toe. <laughs> What's head to toe? I whispered back, a sudden sense of dread squeezing my insides. You know, she said sweetly, your head's on one side, your toe's down there. She gestured with her other hand, my head's over there, my toe's over here. Okay, why? I said, my feet probably smell bad, yours are probably worse. This was me trying to keep things light. Then come on, she said, let's go wash them off. She pulled me into the bathroom, and we sat on the edge of the tub and ran some hot water. While our feet soaked, Missy explained that she was planning on trying to get back together with her ex-boyfriend, Martin, and that she wouldn't feel right sleeping head to toe, to, head to head, toe to toe with me. I'm afraid of what might happen, she said with a mischievous smile. What, I might gouge you with my toenails? The hot water rose to our ankles. Missy's feet looked like they could have belonged to a porcelain doll. Mine looked like they belonged to Bilbo fucking Baggins. <laughs> True. There was no real need to ask why she decided to get back with Martin or at what point over the course of the drive she made the decision, but I did anyway, trying my best to stifle the disappointment. It wasn't like 
I even decided. She said, I just fell asleep while we were driving. And when I woke up, it was like Hakeem going to Canada. I just knew. In a way, this was hardly unexpected. And I didn't so much hurt as feel profoundly tired. Still, I wished I ditched Missy at Sparky so Hakeem could have slept on the couch instead while I curled up with a rug across the room. And sucked that he was fending for himself in an unknown city while the St. Pauli girl soaked her feet in the tub. Weirdly, though, even as I felt burnt and rejected by Missy, my tenderness for her grew. I had the sense that Martin had been the one to break things off with her before, and that by trying to rekindle the romance, she was putting herself in a painful and vulnerable position. I followed her back to the living room, and we arranged ourselves on the sofa head to toe. I clasped her feet in my hands and caressed them and kissed them. They were like warm, polished ivory. She held my feet, too, and caressed them and even kissed them. It was oddly intimate and ecstatic. I thought about Hakeem and his journey north. I wondered if he was still in that booth at Sparky's or if he left and was roaming the city. I could picture him walking up Market Street as night faded and morning edged in, all the way downtown, while bits of trash and clutter kicked against the curb. His wanderings reminded me of my own wanderings, and I hoped and prayed that he would make it to Canada. He never did. Three years later, I was in Honolulu, loping down a dark beach around midnight with a few drinks in me, feeling sorry for myself for being all alone in such a tropical paradise, when I stumbled upon a sprawling party in the sand, a circle of tiki torches, a hundred kids dancing to old school hip hop. Not a tourist vibe, these were locals, artists, college kids, surf rats. Someone handed me a beer and I stood on the edge of the circle brooding on things. In the middle of the party, a few lanky guys with dreadlocks stoked a fire. Deeply tanned, bare-legged girls with hoodies over their swimsuits clustered around them, laughing as they passed a couple of joints back and forth. I watched the DJ on the far side behind his turntables juke his shoulders and pump his arms. And I felt jealous of the guy. It seemed like he'd found his place in the world while I was still as unmoored as ever. The allure of being the DJ finally registered for me. You can be with others and be alone at the same time and feel good about it. As I continued to watch him, he turned my way, he turned my way with a smile. And his features melted from those of a stranger into those of a friend. And I realized that, unfathomably, it was Hakeem. <laughs> Hakeem! I rushed over and gave him an insane hug. What are you doing here? I shouted in his ear, incredulous. Oh, what's up, Davey? He said, I'm just spinning for another half hour, then I'll probably get something to eat. <laughs> he seemed completely unfaced <laughs> by the serendipity of running into each other years after we'd met a couple thousand miles across the globe. Later, near the campus, on the quietest corner of a rowdy intersection, we sat on a curb with falafel sandwiches while stray dogs and drunk students weaved past, and Hakeem caught me up on his journeys. He'd spent his first two months in the Bay living at a homeless shelter for older teens, and then had hit it off with a graphic designer with whom he'd sometimes played chess in the park. The guy had found him working in his office as a receptionist, which after a few months, Hakeem managed to parlay into an entry-level design job. It turned out he was a natural. When the company relocated to New York, he'd made the move too. Hakeem told me about going to visit his dad for the first time in Newark. I don't know what I was expecting, he said, but this wasn't it. His dad had opened the door, stepped outside, spoke with him warily for a minute on the front stoop and sent him on his way. He knew who I was, I think. He said he knew who I was, but what kind of guy does that? His own flesh and blood. Hakeem's voice cracked even as he claimed not to care. Well, it's his life, I could give a fuck. Hakeem liked being part of a team, and the people at work told him he showed great promise, but life in an office wasn't for him. About a year ago, he said he'd come to Hawaii on, a, on vacation with a musician friend, and they both decided to stay. Hakeem found some freelance design work with local businesses, launched a DIY t-shirt label, and over the past few months had finally carved out a niche for himself as a DJ, spinning at bars all over the island. Not bad at age 22. He had a, toy, he had a tight crew of friends and shared a house with 12 of them deep in the mountain jungle. His sister was planning to join him in a few months once he finished with high school back once she finished with high school back home in Vegas. Though he had never reached Canada, his dream of finding community and creative fulfillment seemed, against tall odds, to have been rapturously realized, which gave me a prolonged, satisfying rush. We giggled, thinking back on the night we'd met and our overnight drive from LA to the bay with Missy Freeze. You still with that girl? he asked. <laughs> never was. I took a breath. Well, I, I kissed her feet once. <laughs> I languished in the memory's bittersweetness. Hakeem cocked his head to the side. 
you know, he said, I still don't really know what I'm doing or what life is all about, but man, I was pretty lost back then and I'm not as lost now. I keep telling my sister, there's no key to the universe. You just have to point your way in one direction, keep going, keep going, keep going and see what happens. Canada or bust, I said. How can you smile? That's right. Canada or bust. Thanks, you guys. All right, All right, it's time for some uh, questions. Here, here, yeah, my man Brian's out there, and let me tell you, let me tell the story real quick before we do this Q and A. Um, so, uh, this uh, I don't know, this is a weird story to tell right now, but. Um, Hakeem, I ran into him a year ago. Well, all, all the people in this book, these are all real people. These are all real stories. So there's a story in here. I think one or two of you guys have ever read this book. Um, but, but I know my friend Harriet Dwyer is out there because she wrote a beautiful article about this book on the Believer website. And um, she was talking about the story Human Snowball, which is about a girl in, in Buffalo that I, I uh, was in love with, this girl named Lauren Hill, not the Lauren Hill, but another Lauren Hill. I took a Greyhound bus to Buffalo to surprise her on Valentine's Day don't ever do that. <laughs> do not, don't take a greyhound to, to Buffalo. It's surprise to go on Valentine's Day. Uh, it did work out exactly with Lauren, but, um, but she's still a good friend of mine. She lives in Denver, so I got to see her uh, 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 last month when I was in Colorado. Um, my mom, the first story in, in the book is about my mom, and uh, I hung out with her two nights ago in Michigan. She's awesome. You know, I, I get to see the people that are in, the book, in, in this book because they're all still friends of mine. Um, a year ago, I, I did an event in, in Brooklyn, and, and there he was, Hakeem. I had not seen him since Hawaii. And, and we, 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 we really reconnected. He lives in Harlem now. He's DJing all around New York City. And we had a great night. So I said, you know, next fall, which is now, this fall, um, I, I told him I was going to go on the road again when the paperback came out. And, and uh, so Hakeem agreed to join me on the road. So he's not here tonight. But for the last four weeks, I've been traveling around the country with Hakeem. He's been DJing before and after our events. He's amazing. Um, he's a great guy. Find him on Facebook, Micah the Viper. <laughs> he's awesome. All right. We'll get him out here. We'll get him out here sometime. All right, all right. I, I have some all-time favorite finds to, to wrap up with at the end. And, um, and uh, before we do that, let's, let's do a little Q&A. Uh, Brian and Andy are here with microphones. I think, what, what, how does it work? They can, anybody can just uh, ask a question? AMA, kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But b right. before we get, David, just before we get to the Q&A, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little giveaway. So if you, have a, if you filled out the form with your email, pass it this way. And at the end of the Q&A, I'm going to do a little giveaway. Pass them Pass to your towards right. me. To I'm going to do right. a giveaway too, Brian. I, I, I see your giveaway and I, I raise you. Uh, Ooh. Who wears a small size t-shirt in the audience? Anybody right there? This girl right here. That's you. All right. Who, uh, I'm like Justin Verlander up here. Who's got a me Who wears a medium? All right. This guy right here with the white, white hair? Man or woman? I can't see. I'm, but I got it right to you, right? All right. All right, so who wants tickets to a future? They have incredible events here all the time. Please come back to JCCFF. Who's got, I got another medium right here. Yeah, all right, that's for you. All right, I got a few more. I'll, let me give one more away, and, uh, and then we'll do some of these at the end. I, 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 I look for the T-shirt cannon. Let me see what size this bad boy is. Look for, uh, uh, I don't know. Who wants a mystery size T-shirt? <laughs> if, if, if it's too big for you, you can wear it as, a, as an ID. All right. Sit up front. That's the lesson. All right. Well, who's, got, who's, got, who's got questions? Who's got a question? Can I get another beer? Andy? I'm serious. All right. Sometimes. Sometime. After that. First question here, over here. You got one? No, you're just raising your hand for something else. Who's got a question? Anybody? Yeah, you oh, right. right there. What's your, what, oh. What, right here. What's your name, first of all? GS, just the initials. GS, cheers. Yeah. My question, I just have one, and then more could come, but uh, yeah. can you juggle? I can juggle. Would you like to show us? Yes, uh, for sure. I need three items. Bring them over here. There's not a plant. No, no. Nobody no, no. knows I juggle. No, There's no, a secret no. skill of mine. I don't even know you. Not at yeah, all. Yeah, no, no. Uh, but I, I, hear... give, me, give me three items. I can juggle three. Okay. Yeah, while They're... I stand on a basketball and rap. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now Seriously. they don't have to be the same, right? Um, no. Okay. Challenge me. I, I don't know. I'm okay. This isn't my main profession. Where's but, the third uh, one? But I will juggle. I will juggle three items. Who else has a question? While, while, while these items come up here. No, I'm going to try my best. I see one of them looks like a beer. I'll juggle that. Yeah. Okay. Can you juggle? I want to learn passing. I want to learn uh, so I can do I, it with I the partner. I have done the klutz thing, and I 
used yeah. to be able to Juggling jump. is actually pretty easy to learn. Yeah, I, I, it's okay. but it's, it's really fun. It's a good so, skill. So I, 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 it, okay, if, now let me ask you a, a, an ethical question, GS, while we're on the phone or whatever this is. Um, I, okay. All right, this, this is going to be bad. Um, <laughs> these are odd shaped objects. No, okay, if you're in a supermarket and you just, you know, had a couple of drinks in you, but you decided to do some late night grocery shopping and decided to juggle three pieces of fruit and you drop one, should you buy that? Like, are you obligated to buy it or can you replace it just to hit in there and it's a little bruised? You have to eat it? Eat it, eat it. These are like, these, what's hard about these is not that they're just so weirdly shaped. It's some salmon feast and uh, uh, chopped garlic and a, and a very heavy small metal ball. It's, it's that they're so different in, in weight. So you just wanted to, add, to embarrass myself. But one of the fourth graders, I, I did an uh, event at a school in Oakland earlier today. One of the fourth graders said, what was the most you've ever been embarrassed? So now I'll have a new answer for that. These, I, Thing of, um, that might uh, be better. Antacids. That'd be safe. All right. Let me. I'll, I'll juggle the antacids. <laughs> when in, in doubt, the meantime, do we got another question on that side? Antacids. I don't know that I was going this direction, but I know we're going to Clooney's afterwards. All right. All right. All right. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this at the end of the Q and A. All right. This will be my my uh, reward. Once I sober up, give me ten minutes. This this is this is awesome. I'm gonna juggle these bad boys. On top of a basketball. All right, all right. So we, well, have uh, we have a question over here. I wanted you to. What's uh, your name, sir? My name is Pat. Pat, hi. Can you tell us about your Washington to Washington? Oh yeah. So um, I, I I run a, uh, just a, the, the short version is that um, I do a trip every summer. Um, it's called Washington to Washington. It's the it's um, I used to live in like D.C. and uh, we take a bunch of inner city kids from D.C. hiking and camping for a week every August. Uh, it's called Washington to Washington. The website's washingtontowashington.org. And uh, we take like 20 to 30 kids from D.C., Detroit, and, and New Orleans um, camping every summer. It's really fun. Go to the website, and you'll see all these great pictures. We had an awesome trip this year. We, the first year, we went to Washington, Mount Washington. So it was Washington to Washington. Now we just go anywhere, pretty and cool and nature-like. Um, but, uh, yeah, check out the website. You'll see some amazing pictures. We had a, we had a great time this summer. So, yeah, that's... And it's all, it's all funded through individual donations. It's just like, you know, like uh, people give 10 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, and that supports the program enough that we can bring maybe basically 20 to 30 kids camping every summer. It's, it's super fun, and I don't know. I like telling ghost stories. <laughs> Actually, the girl cried because I told a ghost story that was too, too scary this summer, and I was like, what, what am I is this, this isn't what this trip is supposed to be about. I'm making this poor 7-year-old girl cry, um, but uh, she was okay now. She's okay. No, it's, it's, it's a happy ending. She got to the top of this mountain in, in Pennsylvania. It was awesome. All right. Uh, who else has a question? Over here on the left. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer. Jennifer, hi. Um, the internet guy, did you ever find out if he can do clairvoyant readings too? Or was that a... Flip? Okay, so I called this guy, Ross Ureri. Uh, he, he's a great web designer. He's a great, um, <laughs> he's a great uh, clairvoyant. No, I, I thought it was amazing, and like, I, it's really cool when you have a chance to connect with the people who, who are actually behind these found items. And I was like, I want to interview for the found magazine. He, he was like, he, he was very averse to any publicity, and I was like, dude, man, this will be like good business for you guys because I don't know if you if all have ever seen found number seven. Found number seven on the cover was a guy. It was a flyer from a guy in Albuquerque named Willis Earl Beale. And he was looking for love. He had posted this flyer all around Albuquerque. He's trying to meet a nice, pretty girl. He's like, I enjoy nighttime train stations, chamomile tea. He had drawn a picture of himself in a, in a suit with a polka dot, a bow tie. So I, I actually found, you know, I, his number was on there. I, I found him. I talked to him. He, it's, I learned that he makes uh, incredible music with um, instruments that he's found in the alley or in thrift stores. And I heard his songs. They were amazing. We put him on the cover of Found Number 7. His dream was to meet Chan Marshall from Cat Power. And uh, he was on the cover of Found 7. He said, don't change my number. I want nice, pretty girls to call me. Most deaf saw the issue, called him, and, was, and, and then heard his album. And, and it's amazing. So he put him in touch with these guys at XL Records, which is like White Stripes, MIA, Adele. They signed him to a three-album deal. He is now touring, opening for Cat Power. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> so Will Sorobiel. So I'm saying I'd like to put people on blast. So I wanted to put... Um, the person you asked about who was, oh yeah, uh, I wanted to put uh, 
this guy, the clairvoyant, on blast, but uh, he, he wouldn't have it, so I don't know. He's still doing okay, I think. Davey, my, 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 my instincts, my clairvoyant instincts. Davey, I have a question over here. Yes. Um, you've gotten so much joy out of found objects and things mm. like that. Do you, have you found yourself maybe leaving your backpack open a little bit when you're going around, maybe your briefcase a little unlocked, that you can kind of generate some of this found material for other people? You know, no, I shred all my shit. I don't want any, I don't want to find any stuff. No, um, yeah, have I ever found, uh, have I ever left my stuff open for anyone else to find? A funny thing happened, uh, somebody sent in, I'd I, uh, I done an event in Boston with Sarah Vallon and David Sedaris, and, uh, and it was at the Berkeley School of Music, and, and a few weeks later, somebody sent in a fine, you know, I'm reading through all the stuff. All the stuff gets sent to my folks' house. So I, I open the stuff up now when I'm, when I'm home, and, and uh, I was living with them at the time. So you know, I open this find up, and, and I, immediately I just see my own handwriting. And I, I was, it was like, so, it's so instantly recognizable when you see your own handwriting. So I was like, I found this thing in Boston, and, and it was, I, like, I was nervous that night, so I wrote notes about like, stuff I wanted to say on a napkin, which I fluttered off the stage into the audience. So I've got, he kind of sent it as a joke. I think he knew that I had written it, but still it was like, it blew my mind when I first saw that thing. So no, everything else I'm careful to hide away. Nobody will ever know my secrets, unless you read the book My Heart is an Idiot, which is full of my secrets, <laughs> and it's very available. Um, uh, who else? Who else has a question? I, I think this should be the last the la question. The last, last question. And then here. I'll juggle these, and I'll read a few of my last all-time favorite finds. That that sounds good. But before okay. we do that, um, I want to I want to give away the tickets to oh, yeah. Nancy Sheldon. That's you. Okay, great. Meet me at the at the reception afterwards in the book signing, and I'll give you your tickets. Congratulations. Okay, here's the last question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emilio. I'm, I'm a writer. I just moved here from New York. So, um, Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I, I got a 510 number. I'm Bay. <laughs> uh, East Bay. Um, I wanted to know, it's, um, how far, where, where do you draw the line with the messages that you post, and mm. um, how far are you willing to go with them? And, and you mean, like, when you say the messages, you mean the found items? Yes. Yeah, like, I will publish anything. The more personal, private, raw, intimate, the better. And seriously, but we, we, what we do do is we change the names of all these notes, you know, so the last thing I would want to do is, you know, these are all real people that have written these notes. So the last thing I would want to do is like embarrass somebody, you know, put them in an awkward position. So we're, all, we're very careful to change the names, keep them anonymous. So that way we can, you know, publish these very personal stories, but nobody will ever be, you know, put in a compromising position because of it. Cool. All right. Thank you, Amelia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang out with us later. Um, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this. GS? All right, all right. You gave me these three items. This thing is very light. This thing's very heavy. So this is one of the hardest things I'll ever do. If I fuck up entirely, don't blame me. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what I can do. All right. Now I'm gonna do the garlic. I don't think he's gonna break open. Who wants some Tums? Who wants some Tums? All right. Oh, shit. Is there any more beer? I don't know. I could use one. Seriously, I, uh, I'll, I'll just bring the house lights down. I'll close up with a few of my uh, all-time favorite finds. Um, all right. Um, all right, here we go. So... My friend in Phoenix, he was asking me recently, like, what exactly counts as a found item? Because uh, we have another friend, she's a real purist. She says it must be blowing down the street. And so I was being a smart ass. I'm like, what if it's just laying there? She said, no, it must be blowing. <laughs> so Dan, my friend, he was at this restaurant, and he saw this sign on the door to the kitchen. It just said, caution, door will swing open and nail you. <laughs> So he's like, I don't know if that counts. It's not blowing down the street. It's not laying there. Who knows? It, fuck it. I'm going to grab this thing. So he sneaks up there. He's looking all around. He doesn't want to get caught pulling this thing down. Wham! 
the door swung open and nailed him. <laughs> so he said, be careful when you pick up found stuff. You could get hurt. Here's one from Vancouver. It says, ever cut your skin for fun? Sell your ass. Sleep on the street. Do you like pain? Take heroin. If so, let's start a band. <laughs> Call 246082, leave a message with Jesse. They'll be here at the JCC, November 23rd. Uh, a few more favorite all-time finds. This one from North Carolina. It says, dear Ron, the longer I think about what I'm doing, the sicker I feel. Ron, I'm sorry, but I don't think we should continue to have a relationship together, at least not as a couple. I love you, but things have not been the same since we found out that we were related. <laughs> I hate when that shit happens. If you no longer want to speak to me, I'll understand. I'll still come visit you. I just don't know what to say. Love always, Alicia. And, you know, my friends helped me open up all this found stuff. And my friend, Adrian, she read this one and, like, burst into laughter, passed it to me. I was laughing, but... Later, we were thinking about it. It's so hard to find true love in this world. It's so hard to find that one special someone. Like, how bad would that suck? You finally find them, and it's, you know, your cousin or your sister. Uh, here's, here, here's another one. I, well, I can relate to this one in a sense because, um, well, it was found in Minneapolis, and, and, and I, I'm always making monthly budgets myself. I always try to sort that out so at the end of the month I'm not totally broke. This guy had typed it up lost it, and somebody found it in, in Minneapolis and sent it in to me. So it says, monthly budget, rent 600, cell phone 50, electric gas 45, cable 60, bus taxi 60, food 500, liquor 600, <laughs> laundry 30, crack 600, <laughs> attorney 250, miscellaneous 250, savings 100. So that is a responsible dude. <laughs> Putting 100 bucks away into savings every month. <laughs> If we could spend a little bit less on crack and liquor, you know, he'd be golden. Um, all right, here's one that's a little bit different. And this one um, it w was found outside of Chicago, a town called Grays Lake, Illinois. It's, I, I've, I've shared this one before here in t when I've been here in town, but it's, it's really one of my all-time favorites. And it's just a kid writing to his mom. The woman that found it told me the story of where she found it. But let me, let me read it to you first. I'll tell you a little bit more about it afterwards. Here it is. Um, this kid says, Dear Mom, I miss you. I really wish you were here. There's been a lot of bad stuff in my life, but I'm sure you already know that. There's also been some really good things, like Justin. He's my best friend, and so is Bethany. Hey, Mom, guess what's the best part of all? There's a girl. Her name is Jenna. We've been dating for about a month and a half now. I love her so much. I know if you were here, you would like her a lot. She makes me so happy. There's nobody I've ever been more happy with. She's changed my life in so many ways. She's there for me. She's someone who actually cares about me. I prayed to God every day that I would get her, and I did. It's unbelievable. I remember when I was suicidal? Not anymore. I wouldn't even think about it. I just love her so much for being with me, you know? This girl is wonderful, Mom. She helps me through a lot. I love her more than she can imagine. I never felt this way about anyone. I would die for this girl, Mom. I love her so much, and she's scared that we're not going to see each other when I move, but I promised her we would see each other just like normal. Well, I got my license this summer, so I can be out here every day. So yeah, I got to go. I love you so much, Mom. I'll write you again. Bye. Your son, Colin. P.S. Trevor misses you too. And so, you know, the, the woman that had found this, like she told me the story, she said, you know, the way she explained it to me, she said that, that she was at a cemetery. And the middle of the place was like a big old oak tree and, and like caught up in the highest branches was a balloon with a ribbon coming down it, and tied to the ribbon was a piece of paper. So she scaled all the way up the tree to pull down the note and, you know, of course, there was this note right here. So I, you can just, like, picture this kid, like, going to visit his mom at the cemetery, you know, like, writing her this note, sending it up to her in, like, a balloon up to heaven. And for me, it's ones like this one that just move and affect me, you know, so much that make me want to pick up every piece of paper I see floating down the street, blowing down the alleyway, hanging from a balloon in a tree. And I, I know some of you guys have, have sent stuff in to Found Magazine before because we get, we get more stuff from, from San Francisco and, and Oakland and Berkeley, more stuff from the Bay Area than any other place in the country. But, yeah, it's true. But, but I, uh, I hope, too, the rest of you will feel inspired. You know, if you see something laying there, just to pick it up and, and take one second to pick it up and just see if it's something interesting. And if it is, you know, send it in to me and my friends so we, we can put it in Found Magazine and the Found Books and, and just you know, just like um, share, share it back out with, with everybody else.
All right, uh, I found this one just a few blocks from my old house in Ann Arbor. It's, uh, it's a kid writing to his dad. He just says, uh, Dad, come get me at the coffee shop when you're done taking a crap. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of a haiku like beauty and simplicity <laughs> to that one. I can't even explain why I love this one so much, but I do. Uh, what do I got? Two, two last finds to share with you guys. Um, to wrap up the night, this one came from uh, another Chicago suburb, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. It's written to Amos. Amos, last night was terrible. I'm so mad at you. I thought we agreed about that thing you do, you know? It's not kinky, it's gross. <laughs> you need to get over this phase of yours. If you don't, well, you can just sleep alone. Sorry I couldn't say this to your face, but I can't bear to look at you right now. I have to go. I have calculus next period. <laughs> don't call me. I don't want to talk to you or see you later. You better get over this. It's really damaging our sex life. Love, Mary, but love is all crossed out. <laughs> and, you know, I'm always looking for slogans to be the new found magazine motto. And I like to borrow phrases from within some of these found notes. Like someone gave me a flyer. As one kid's, he was looking for other kids to be in this death metal band. So he had ups and down crosses, pentagrams. And it said at the top, help us bring the darkness. <laughs> So I always like to say, Found Magazine, help us bring the darkness. But my new favorite slogan has become, Found Magazine, it's not kinky, it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, one last find. One last find to share with you guys. Uh, let me tell you a couple things first. Uh, let me tell you what, we got, we got some tables out front. And my good friends, uh, Raj and Sarah and Natasha, they're going to be out there helping out, helping out. And I'll be out there. Um, we have all the found magazines, issues one through eight. Uh, we, maybe uh, we, we might have like found, found number five, six, and eight. Anyways, this is the, the newest issue, found number eight. Found number nine will be out around Thanksgiving. But check out the issues out front. Five bucks for a magazine, three for ten. Good, good deal. This is dirty found, which is the shit that's too hot for found magazine. <laughs> and the shit in found is can be pretty fucked up, but uh, this shit's straight nasty. It comes steeled in plastic. Um, it, it's, it's 10 bucks. You have to be 18 years old and show ID, so they're going to be very strict about it out there, if you dare. We've got a few copies left of Dirty Found. Um, Where's this book I wrote? Oh, here it is. All right, so this is, the, this is the book I wrote. It's called My Heart is an Idiot. Um, as I said, you know, stories about love and relationships, uh, stories about interesting people I've met o over the last uh, 10 years traveling around. It's been a really, it came out in hardcover a year ago, and then it came out a few weeks ago in, in paperback here, and it's been just amazing uh, getting emails from people who have read the book and, uh, and, and Facebook messages, and um, it's just really meaningful to hear that the book is resonating with people. So I, I'd be honored if you guys want to check out the book. Um, I put together a little special for you guys. Let me explain this, because I want you to go home with a copy of the book. Um, this well, my, I worked for, I, show, I said this show, This American Life, and uh, my boss, Ira Glass, put together a CD with a bunch of stories I've done for the radio show over the years, including the first story when I went to visit Mr. Rogers. And first I interviewed all my neighbors in Chicago about the conflicts they were having with each other, and then I played the tapes for Mr. Rogers and let him, like, mediate their disputes. It was amazing. No, he had all the puppets out from the land of make-believe. King Friday, X the Owl, Daniel Striped Tiger, you know, they're all putting together their, you know, they all had their own two cents to put in on my, on my neighbor's problems. Mr. Rogers, I mean, he was, he was an incredible guy, and I was honored to get to know him a little bit. So there's a story on this CD about him. There's one about my mom. My mom is deaf, and she channels this ancient spirit named Aaron. So I did a whole investigation into that. She, uh, we went to Brazil to visit this miracle healer, this guy named John of God, to see if we could get her hearing back. There's people there from all over the world, people with cancer, with AIDS, um, people in wheelchairs, you know, all, all seeking healing. So we were there for a month. It was a really intense trip. Anyway... It's two CDs. I think on the This American Life website, it's like 20 bucks. Tonight for you guys. Check this out. All right. My Heart is an Idiot, the book. A CD. Uh, this American Life CD. I, this, this one came out last week, too. It's got, have you guys ever heard of Wiretap Bullseye with Jesse Thorne? Santa Cruz, Sound of Young America. Um, or a Snap Judgment from Oakland, California. You guys ever heard those shows? All right. So they, they put a new CD out with a bunch of This American Life uh, pieces I did, and, and then a bunch of uh, new, newer This American Life pieces, and then Snap Judgment and other ones. Anyways, my heart is an idiot book, any CD, any magazine, 20 bucks. What the fuck? <laughs> Am I crazy? Am I drunk? <laughs> yeah. But I, I, listen, like, 
The idea is not to make profit off these things. The idea is, you know, when you, when you create art, you want to share it with people. So, you know, 20 bucks, that's my cost on, the, on all this stuff. I would love for you guys, 20 bucks, cash, I t we, they, they're going to take out front, cash, checks, or IOUs. I'm not even kidding. If, hopefully you have cash or check. You can write checks out to me. If you have IOUs, they'll take your, you know, they'll take your info, and you can just, whatever you want. I want you to walk home with this stuff. So 20 bucks, any book, any magazine, any CD. And there's a bunch of other fun stuff out there, but check that stuff out. All right, let me, let me wrap up now with, with a, uh, my all-time favorite find. And, and before I read to you guys this one, it, it really has become my all-time favorite. I just want to say special thanks to, to a few people tonight, um, especially, you know, our hosts tonight. You know, this, this is an amazing space. They work so hard to bring in incredible speakers all the time. I'm honored to even be a part of this Arts and Ideas series. So can we give, please give some love to Ben, Beth, Andy, Brian Garrick, everybody that works hard to keep JCCSF going. The ushers. Everybody, I really, really appreciate them. Our event tonight was sponsored by two organizations I love, Reboot and McSweeney's. So thanks to those guys. I love them to pieces. Um, I, uh, thanks to all the, all the media folks here in, in San Francisco who have, who have repped found for so long. Um, KQED had a fun time uh, smoking blunts with Michael Krasny in the, in the, in the boys' room uh, at KQED earlier today. And then, uh, you know, SF Weekly. Um, uh, all, all, all these other great media organizations that, uh, that, that supported this event. We really, really appreciate that uh, in the Bay Area. And then um, I want to tell you guys about the after party. So I have a friend in town. His name is Isaac Fitzgerald. He's kind of a crazy motherfucker. And he texted me uh, 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 an idea for an after party. I thought, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's the idea of traveling around the country is to get to meet new people. You know, hang out with my friends that I've had, and I have some great Bay Area friends, but also to meet new people. So we're having a little after party. There's a bar called Clooney's. That I've been to once before. I think it's at 25th and, and, and Valencia. Is that where it is? I've been there once before. Um, I have like a little bit of mushrooms. I have like this much. <laughs> but I will each have like a tiny spore. I'm not even kidding. Uh, or if you don't want to do mushrooms, just at least have a drink with us. Come have it. Seriously. One or two of you will take me up on that. <laughs> Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> we'll juggle while we're shrooming. Um, I have a, a plane to catch at 5 a.m., but, but we'll do a little, little bit, and uh, we'll play some pool, and, uh, and we'll have some drinks. So come to Clooney's, come to the after party in the Mission. We'd we'll love to hang out with you guys. Uh, actually, I'll be, right out, I'll be right out here at the table. I, if you get a book, I would love to write an extremely personal message in your book. Uh, hang out here. We'll have another drink, or I don't know if the bar's still open up front. We'll, we'll do it up in the, in the lobby, and then we'll go down to Clooney's. So join us. Please join us. Um, have you guys heard about this new website called... Um, what, uh, what this, what this is called uh, Facebook.com. Um, there's a Found Magazine Facebook page. My Heart is an Idiot book has a Facebook page. I have a, web, I have a Facebook page. Davey Rothbart. I want to be friends with you on Facebook, so, so find me, and we'll do it up. All right. Do look for the one where there's a picture of me with the Eastern Michigan jersey. All right. Let me, let me wrap up. We've got to get out of here. We've got to get to Clooney's. They're waiting for us. Um, this is... Uh, this, this is one of my all-time favorite finds. Seriously, you got, and thank you guys for coming out tonight because Found Magazine is, is a community art project. It only exists because people have been finding stuff and sending it to us from all over the country. So the fact that you're here makes me happy. Maybe you'll tire, tell your friend about it that lives in L.A., South Carolina, South Korea. You know, maybe they'll find something and send it in to us. The fact that you're here makes me so happy. So if you brought found stuff, I want to see it tonight. Somebody already gave me some found stuff earlier tonight. Um, I would love to see that stuff. Um, if you have any questions, I'll just be right out in the lobby. We'll, we'll, we'll hang out. I would, I would love to talk to you more. All right, this, this found note is from Providence, Rhode Island. And as we travel around the country, I get to meet the people who have found this stuff and, and hear the stories about where they found it. So this woman told me she found this in her front yard, this woman in Providence, Rhode Island. This note had just kind of blown itself into her lawn. It's in kids' handwriting. It says at the top, Adventure Club. Adventure Club. How to get into the club. You need to know how to climb a fence. You need to like adventure. And then the rules. No messing up the club. Don't bring anything in without permission from Shane or Ethan. You have to be nice to squirrels. <laughs> and finally, most importantly, you can't tell anyone where or what the club is. So the woman that found this, she thought she might know who Shane and Ethan were. Just some of the neighborhood kids, you know, she'd see them running around with their friends. She went up to them on the street a few days later and started asking them about the adventure club and reciting all these top secret rules. So the kids are shocked, you know, like, how does she know all this classified information? <laughs> she told them that her dog, named Kismet, had overheard them making up the rules. <laughs> the kids were speechless. 
<laughs> As they're walking away, she heard the youngest one say to his friend, whoa, Kismet hurt us. <laughs> so, you know, years have passed. You know, these kids are probably like 19, 20 years old. We saw this woman in Providence a couple weeks ago. She said she still likes to imagine them being really secretive around any dog after that. <laughs> you guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. It was so much fun. Yeah. Hang out with us in the lobby. Check out the table. Thanks again to JCCSF. Clooney's. Let's do it. <laughs>